My name is Jacek Kowitz-Kaso. I'm the um, Deputy Director of Creature. Creature is a, a research centre uh, that's going to officially launch on the 25th of February. Um, we're going to post by the end of this session uh, the, um, uh, the, the details of our launch. We absolutely welcome all of you to join us. Uh, we're going to launch uh, Creature in conjunction with uh, its um, sister centre called Cube. Creature is our research centre mainly focusing on art and design. Cube is our research centre um, mainly mm. focusing on architecture, but I should say that absolutely both research centres are interdisciplinary at their core and that's why they're connected together, but also that's why even within their practices they we champion uh, interdisciplinarity. And today's session is all about that because we've got uh, two completely different perspectives coming from uh, architecture and coming from creative writing and literature. And um, that's exactly the, the idea that we want to foster. So to foster new conversations by looking uh, across disciplines. Um, so other things to say about um, about what we what we do is that uh, these sessions, many of you will be familiar with these sessions, which we call the Creature and Cube sessions that happen every uh, Thursday, either at lunchtime or in the early evening, such as today. And um, and essentially, we've got a full uh, list of events uh, happening that we absolutely invite you all to uh, to check on our respective websites. Um, so today I'm very, very pleased to uh, introduce this, uh, to chair this session, and I'm just going to give you a couple of details before we start. Um, so the session, as you know, of course, is called Creativity, Indeterminacy and Representation. And so again, an officially um, uh, hosted by Creature. And in this particular session, we invite uh, Trevor Norris and Luke Jones uh, to um, puzzle through the ways in which a process or conceit of representation places us in felt and inhabited spaces. And um, so we're going to start with Trevor, Trevor's paper. Um, so let me just introduce Trevor. So Trevor is the course leader of the undergraduate program in creative writing and English literature at London Met. His research interests lie in the crossover of eco-philosophy, eco-poetics and nature writing. So we'll hear from, from Trevor first, after which we'll go um, straight to Luke jo Luke's uh, paper and we try and, and encourage the questions to be at the end of both papers so that we can really create um, uh, an interdisciplinary uh, debate. Having said that, of course, if you've got any pressing questions right after uh, the respective papers, feel free to ask as well. Um, so I'm going to ask everybody to, be, to place themselves on mute while we do the uh, presentations and, um, and enjoy. So thank you, Trevor. Myself. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. I'm going to start off um, by reminding people of the principles of the seminar, and I'm going to try to answer these um, four questions. And, and, and so this is a rough idea for um, research. And um, one of the things we're asked to think about is, um, why did we start? How are we going about it? What did we find? Um, and what um, does it mean? And, and this discussion, and Chair, please, um, let me know when 15 minutes are up and I'll um, hopefully um, tidy things up and come to a conclusion. Um, so this discussion relates to a nature writing syllabus, which we had uh, just come to the end of teaching when the pandemic took hold a year ago. And when the experience of nature and travel was collapsed for, for many people into this digital space. And, and thinking about this reduction of space ecologically, where within a pedagogical context, we're trying to open up students' sense of, of space, this results from the mutagenic effect of over extraction of nature, uh, the fact that we all find ourselves in this very odd space at this time. And um, the zoonotic jump um, of viruses cross the species barrier uh, in the context of uh, wet markets. So we're in an, an odd space, thinking and writing about nature. And I want to try to uh, think through the odd spatialities uh, of thinking and writing about nature. And if what happens uh, out of this discussion can become a paper or an article, uh, that would be good. Um, so the first thing I think to, to, to think about is that nature writing full stop it, it is a very odd spatiality for thinking about nature. And that odd spatiality is very often descriptive realism. And I'm going to, to come back to that point. And, and Timothy Morton, some of whose ideas I'm going to, to touch on over the course of what I say, addresses the odd spatiality of nature writing in his book, 
uh, ecology without nature. So I'm just going to share my screen with you and start sharing some slides. So this is from an early uh, chapter uh, in the book, and he says this, as I write this, I'm sitting on the seashore. The gentle sound of waves lapping against my deck chair coincides with the sound of my fingers typing away at the laptop. Overhead, the cry of a gull pierces the twilit sky, conjuring up a sensation of distance. The smoke trail of an ocean liner disappears over the far horizon. The surrounding air is moist and smells of seaweed. The crackle of pebbles on the shore as the waves roll in reminds me of England, summer holidays on stony beaches. No, that was pure fiction, just a tease. As I write this, a western scrub jay is chattering outside my window, harmonising with the quiet scratch of my pen on this piece of paper. The sound of Debussy's trio for flute, viola and harp falls gently around me from the speakers in the living room. The coolness of the air conditioning suggests the blazing heat of the California afternoon. The crop spraying, pla uh, crop spraying plane buzzes low overhead. That was also just fiction. What's really happening, as our, and, and he goes on and he rolls through this um, uh, sequences of, of false starts. And I think this is really interesting um, because it al allows us to think about uh, what is going on when we claim proximity to nature in what has become a very popular uh, genre, nature and travel writing over the last couple of years, even more so in the pandemic, um, in fact. Um, books on, on nature writing and travel writing have flown off the shelves as we're trapped in this space. So again, to come back to the first point, it's very interesting to think about the way our sense of space and travel has been reduced as we find ourselves uh, in, in digital space uh, during the pandemic. So um, a good place to get a sense of what's being bought by people in nature writing is the Wainwright Prize. And I, I'm not sure if people um, know about it. It's um, since 2014, it's the UK's leading uh, nature uh, uh, prize, nature writing prize. And, and often that involves travel writing as well, because the conceit is that people are traveling out of cities to this space in order to encounter nature. Um, and when we were thinking about um, syllabus design um, for a, a nature and travel writing uh, undergraduate course, it was really hard to decide um, which text to include, not because there were so many, but because so much nature writing is produced in the same mode. And you can just see, these are some examples of the, the long list um, from the Wainwright Prize over the last uh, couple of year. years. And even, years, and even if you, you just scan very quickly through the titles, you can already see in the way that the books are, are titled a kind of similarity, things are kind of occupying the same sort of space. And I want to argue, I think, um, you know, there's a problem with nature writing. So this is the, the thesis of the talk. Um, there's a problem with nature writing. Is nature writing about nature? Um, you can see from the titles, nature writing forms a kind of boundary drawing, inside outside division. And it's specific to our way of thinking, a, kind of a metaphysics, a cosmology about what nature is. And, and that's what Timothy Morton in his uh, eco-criticism, eco-philosophy is asking us to consider. And nature writing and the kind of thing that you can see that makes its way often into the, the, the long lists uh, of the Wainwright, Wainwright Prize, it often um, fits a, a, a very contemporary narrative, you know, specific um, class-based one, it's characterised by kind of uh, early 21st century English pastoralist yearning. And this yearning is often happening inside white middle-class enclaves in industrially capitalised urban space. The Fence magazine, um, issue six, um, and there's a theme for the uh, for the issue called State of Nature, makes an argument about this. Um, and I'm just gonna read out a quotation from that by, by the, the start of the article by Richard Smythe. He says, something is wrong in the Robert McFarlane extended universe, also known as the genre of nature writing. A few years back, Mark Cocker fretted that books on nature had become a literature of consolation. From a different direction, Stephen Poole derided the bourgeois escapism of it all, nostalgie de la boue, nostalgia for the mud, of a kind with North London farmers markets. Most fiercely, Joe Kennedy went after the genre's cookie cutter poetics of belonging and self-care. This note is best understood through the I, the first person, specifically the first person present, set, uh, present tense. This style is used in modern, na modern nature writing like an in crowds dress code signifying at a glance that this is that sort of nature writing, personal, lyrical, dressed with multiple uh, gushing blurbs and long listed for the Wainwright Prize. And so to grab a fistful at random, as I look out of the back window, I see the shattered rooms of a former dwelling, 
which is skeleton from beyond the fell wall. The fog fills the moment and I walk towards it, into it, yet never quite reaching it, Benjamin Myers under the rock. I watch the geometry of winter trees, Paul Evans, the essay, Shrewsbury to Crew. And, and you can see exactly the same kind of conceit that Timothy Morton is identifying in, in ecology without nature. So we can go one critical slice into things and we can criticize the classness, the whiteness, the four by four trip out to an Airbnb rented cottage in the wilderness in order to come alive again through contact with nature and the feelings that this evokes. And when we were trying to think about what we would put on the syllabus, we, had, we, we wanted to avoid this middle class white people coming alive in nature narrative in the texts we discussed. Um, but I want to go another slice into it. Um, that metaphor helps, um, but maybe not in the way that we think. Um, that's the theme here, the way that a certain kind of description of nature doesn't coincide with nature. We know what depth and space and volume are supposed to mean. Um, when it comes to spatial depth within a material volume, we can see that whatever we drop into a hole is falling into somewhere down there. But, but if we're thinking about the way that metaphors of inside and outside sit within our imagination as a guide to our experience, then the description of the surface of an outside that doesn't reveal anything about the boundary between inside and outside, and that's what I think a lot of nature writing is, seems like a good place to look. So the kind of um, nature writing most in evidence uh, at the moment, and again, I'm just gonna go back to that slide, is a kind of Robinsonade. That's a nice term um, uh, from uh, English literature um, relates to Robinson Crusoe, this sort of fantasy of isolation and distance and self-discovery and autonomy. So it's a sort of Robinsonade where the solitary individual goes into pristine nature or encounters wild and human animal life in the mode of physical or emotional adventure. And then something which is forgotten, something emotional, psychological, uh, which has been forgotten is remembered, revived. So a lot of, of nature writing is a kind of Orphic promise where contact with nature means we come back to life. And there's something to say uh, about this, even if it, in its most eco-rhapsodic forms, nature writing doesn't seem to fulfill the promise of Orpheus and when Orpheus, you know, the classical figure of, 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 of poetry and song in the, um, in, the, in the classical Greek tradition, when Orpheus sings uh, on his lyre and plays the music, it's not just that his sense of nature comes alive, but nature itself comes alive and not just uh, animals um, that start to talk, but uh, rocks uh, and trees and rivers, everything starts to, to move and become articulate. So even in, I'll say this again, even, even in its most eco-rhapsodic forms, our form of, of nature writing doesn't seem to fulfill the promise of Orpheus, which is to make rivers and trees and stones come alive. In most nature writing, plants and animals in their alien nature make human beings come alive again. I think that's quite a different thing. So um, I want to turn to um, a, uh, a text um, uh, and you can see this, this one here, Juliet Blackland's The Easternmost House. So I put that in there because its title refers to this book by Henry Beston, which is called The Outermost House. And that uh, book on the right is a forerunner. It's an, a very early 20th century work of, of nature writing. I don't know if anybody's read it. It's very, it's very beautiful. But in some ways, it's also quite a, an odd and unusual text. And it, it sets up a convention uh, for nature writing, um, which a lot of these other works follow, even in their title, um, like the Easternmost House. So it was published in 1928, and it's essentially a therapeutic post-World War I novel, um, but you would never know it uh, from the text. There's no reference to the war. What Beston does is he builds a house um, on the outer banks, um, of the seashore, sorry, of the um, of Cape Cod and lives there for a year. So the novel is about the cycle of the year, about the meteorological and oceanic forces that are powering their way through the world, Beston presents. One chapter, I think it's chapter three if I recall, um, focuses solely on the changing patterns of waveforms throughout the year as they hit the shore. Birds and animals migrate and Beston observes their interactions at a distance and in the mode of non-intervention, he reduces himself to an observer, but he also uh, maximizes himself as the authority that encompasses the whole and makes it possible for us to be there. In the book, and this is a sort of trope that's very often used in nature writing, he's the author of his own disappearance from social space. 
and in nature he turns the volume up on solitary detached observation. Emotionally it's a very sparse and simplified text in terms of relatedness. Nature is something he escapes into for a year and he focuses on the bare essentials of survival in sympathy with nature and that's you know, his own expression. Reducing his needs and his appetites to subsistence. It's a very sort of sparse world that he presents us with and again that's often a trope uh, of nature writing. Let's get away from all the comforts of the city and we'll go into this sparse space of, uh, of endurance and something true and more authentic about ourselves will come alive. So the book is about food, fuel, shelter, warmth, and he forgoes human company other than the passing acknowledgement of other lone men who are guarding the shore and they're trying to prevent some of them ships from foundering on the rocks. So there's a genre here, there's a trope, um, the solitary, rugged, heroic individual who discovers nature through quiet observation um, and this observation of nature is underpinned by a Linnaean taxonomy of plants and animals and birds and particularly in Beston's text you know, he, he uses um, uh, the, the Latin names for, for birds uh, and, uh, and plants. So um, yeah, so um, a Linnaean taxonomy of observation of plants, animals and birds and a cosmological and meteorological inventory of season and winds and migrations and tides. And conveniently, Beston omits, even though the cultures are present by their place names, the first peoples who lived in this place and knew it for generations before being wiped out by uh, white settlers. So there's a kind of blankness, there's a historical sort of flattening out uh, in the presentation of nature. here. And there's an additional um, problem with this kind of eco-rhapsodic nature writing. And that is that it's it's anthropocentrically scaled and that's a term that, that, that Timothy Morton uses when he's thinking about nature. The way that we think about nature is that it's anthropocentrically scaled. It all fits inside a picture of a human being like, like you and me doing something we can imagine uh, doing. Um, and now let's come on to um, uh, Timothy Morton in a bit more detail. Thinking ecologically, he suggests, means that we have to try to imagine what it means to be human at the scale of anthropogenic climate change. And that means involving, uh, imagining rather, what he calls the hyper object uh, of human action. That, that is what humans are doing, which is, you know, ac across this extraordinary scale uh, of time uh, and space in a way that it's almost impossible for us to imagine, something that can't be reduced to the empirical scale of you, me, here, in this place right now. And so you can see uh, some of the, uh, a lot of the guarantees of nature writing are precisely that. Here you are, you think back to that, 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 the, the way that Morton begins the chapter and, and that criticism um, of, of eco-writing. Here we are, you and me, in this place right now, observing nature, it's come alive through uh, my careful description in prose. Timothy Morton is suggesting that writing about nature um, might mean writing about what a, a weird and unnatural thing nature might be. And so perhaps uh, nature writing also needs to move into this weird and unnatural space. Timothy Morton's work can help us uh, understand this, I think, because his picture of nature is so counterintuitive and strange. And I really encourage people to have a look um, at his work. In, in, I'm going to mention a little bit about his uh, 2017 book, Humankind. But there's a version, a pelican um, uh, version of that, which is called Being Ecological, which is the same kind of argument that you find in humankind um, and that's worth looking at as well. So um, writing about nature writing means writing in some sense about what a weird and unnatural genre it is and, and most nature writing therefore might not be uh, about nature because writers are approaching nature uh, assuming that it is um, something um, it, casting it almost in the same way that big fossil fuel burning companies approach nature. You know, it's, it's um, this Heideggerian uh, idea of the standing reserve. Nature's, nature writers are treating nature as if it's some kind of battery that will release an energy for human emotional cure. So in this sense, um, there is a problem uh, in nature writing. Perhaps it's a problem of literary realism. And so much of nature writing is written in this guaranteeing experiential mode. You know, here I am, in this place it's feeling these things and you could feel them in the same way if you were here with me now which in a way you are because look how close you're getting to nature because of this prose uh, what's the way out 
um, I think you can only get hung up on whether the prose description of nature is an adequate representation of things if you think that when you're next to the thing in nature you're fully present to it that it's fully present to you and that you are also fully present to yourself and rather than this fetishization of presence both in our sense of what nature is and in the way we write about nature in all of these relations I mean, your, your, your relationship to yourself your relationship to nature um, uh, in all of these things in in these relations rather things recede and withdraw Patriot. as much as they have an effect five minutes, is five that minutes. My five minute thank point? you sorry yeah. to, but, but take your time take your time no, 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 don't worry. Um, I'll come to a close. So Morton's argument is that nature, um, rather than this anthropocentrically scaled thing, which is there in the mode of a kind of lump of extension, and you can go out there and use descriptive realism uh, to describe it and get close to it, and thereby, by virtue of that authentic proximity, something in you can come alive. Morton's argument is that nature is this messy, ragged, porous, incomplete series of effects across endlessly proliferating scales that, that don't add up to a whole that has what he calls a top access mode. Um, that is, human representation of nature isn't nature. Uh, and, and this doesn't mean that all you're left with is a representation or a means of representation instead of relatedness to an environment. Rather, it means that relatedness to an environment is porous. It, it's full of holes. It doesn't add up to, to something. It is full of inconsistency. And Morton uses this term throughout his writing, and, and particularly in Humankind, which is really great. It, it's always less than the sum of its parts. So any attempt to use language to convey a holistic picture of nature is trading in a metaphysics, first and foremost, rather than giving us a sense of nature that might transform our sense of where we are and what we are ourselves. And that's really the issue for us. This is an ecological emergency and we need a transformative picture. Our current picture of nature in nature writing is of a big empty space that's mostly full of geological lumps, plus the specially elected animals who are worthy of our picturesque attention, plus large and small botanical specimens. And added to this, we have a narrative vantage point of a, a weak form of religious moralism, as in this is a good and virtuous thing to be doing here, describing all uh, either as the narrator, this is describing all of this for the reader or as the reader. You know, we're doing something virtuous and good, immersing ourselves in this text. So to come back to this point, Glenn, um, this is what I think a, a lot of nature writing largely is. It's writing about the surface of an outside that doesn't really reveal anything about the boundary between inside and outside in terms of the, the natures of our being or our relatedness to other beings. And understanding uh, our being and our relatedness to other beings seems like uh, an imperative in the ecological emergency. So inside, outside the strange nature uh, of, of boundaries, um, this is what uh, Morton is asking us to attend to. I think I'm going to um, stop at this point and then pick up these uh, uh, ideas a little, little later on. I've got some additional slides that I can show you that where we get a bit closer to what the picture of nature that Timothy Morton uh, is asking us to, to feel our way through. Thank you so much, Trevor. That's that's really interesting um, in the way uh, that we reflect on these on these issues. And um, I'm wondering whether there's any uh, pressing questions that the audience um, uh, wants to ask. And otherwise, we'll move swiftly to the next paper in order to then come back to both papers and create a conversation. Uh, somebody was asking, um, uh, Trevor, uh, were we supposed to? The uh, your presentation stayed at slide four. Was uh, was it meant? Yes, to be... okay. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was intentional. I mean, I've got I more things okay. to show. Um, we've got we've got a bit of time ahead of us, and there are more. Oh, brilliant! Things, um, Excellent. So we we'll definitely come back later on. That's great. So, um, just so you know, uh, we we're having some issue with Zoom sometimes when we do conversations because uh, for some reason sometimes. The, the whoever chairs like myself today cannot necessarily see who's who's um, raising their hand. So in which case, hopefully Hannah can help me 
uh, with this, but hopefully there's nobody raising their hand at the moment. We're going to then move swiftly to, to the next paper. And as I said, we then come back to both papers to, um, to create a discussion. So, um, so as I was uh, saying before, the idea for these uh, for these sessions is that they encourage interdisciplinary thinking, and that's why uh, both speakers today come from completely different um, perspectives and different disciplines. So, I'm going to, to introduce to you uh, Luke Jones. Uh, Luke is the course leader on the Architecture and Interior Design Extended Degree Foundation course. He lectures in history and theory on the extended degree and architecture BA courses and is an uh, ARB registered architect. He is also co-founder of the Urban Ecology Collective Heat Island and hosts the podcast about buildings and cities. So thank you, Luke. So feel free to start. Great. Lovely to be here. Let me just share my screen. And so I'm going to give a little talk which is structured around a particular and kind of mysterious term of art from um, 19th century architecture, or allegedly so. So poche or poche uh, is a term um, originating in the kind of theory and practice of architecture in the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in, um, uh, in France. Um, but which, and it's probably, that, that school is kind of rich in a whole sort of very hyper-specific jargon of architectural design process, um, uh, of which this, I think, is the only term which is like indisputably in kind of in use in earnest still. Um, and um, the story of how that happens and how it um, migrates um, and becomes kind of translated into a post, uh, you know, neoclassical world um, is sort of interesting um, and the, the kind of this sort of uh, the evolution of this term in into something like a kind of placeholder for the role of the indeterminate or the unknown or the kind of um, abstracted out of existence in the process of design. Um, it's something which I think is sort of interesting and which I, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, the form of the, pro the presentation is that it's a bit of, a, of a, a gathering together of a whole series of different loose threads in um, my own work. Uh, there is a little bit of research. Um, there is uh, some, there are some sort of drawings and things and there is a, the evidence of a brief dalliance with machine learning about two thirds of the way through. Um, but all of which hopefully will be um, held together under, under the kind of gravity of this idea. Um, so for the, for the uninitiated, um, Poche refers to the black bits that you can see in this architectural plan, the coloured in walls. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's a French term. Its etymology is somewhat obscure. Uh, there is a verb to pocket on Poche, which is probably comes from, um, and there are various attempts to sort of explain the coinage, the most attractive and poetic of which is that it, it, this sort of metaphorically represents um, a kind of opening up of the page into a kind of hidden void underneath the paper, as it were. So that, that's what's going on in the, in the process of um, creating these sort of deep wells of uh, like black unknown uh, inside the um, geological lumps of the of the built fabric as it were um, and the architect most uh, who the sort of pivotal figure in um, translating this uh, term into something still with kind of currency in um, uh, in modernity is the um, American architect Lou Kahn um, and he tells a sort of story about um, the role of this idea in his work, which he, through the poeticism of the hollow column. So um, this is an early and kind of, uh, um, yeah, sort of, uh, a sort of influential um, uh, project in his, um, in his earth, which is this uh, little bathhouse for a Jewish community in New Jersey. And, what he taught, he, he tells a story uh, that he was inspired by um, the structural piers of St. Peter's Church uh, uh, Cathedral in Rome, which are these like enormous masses of um, 
masonry and um, the idea that these things although structurally kind of solid and performing a kind of role as mass in the plan nevertheless contain something and he um he, he credits this with his arriving at this sort of strategy in which these apparently like quasi monumental boxy things that you see at the corners in this photo um can actually be deployed in order to hide all of the various sort of untidinesses of um of uh, the programmatic requirements of um a modern building uh, so they contain kind of toilets uh, uh some sort of circulation spaces um uh treatment plant for chlorination these sorts of things which um are best kept out of the way uh so yeah for, it's just worth putting a pin in that for him it's the idea is this this um hollow column uh he's referring to these like massive um piers that you see in the plan of saint peter's um which have their own series of um, uh, kind of conspiracy theories in architectural history. The one which is told is that they're so massive um, that you could fit the, um, ex it's this thing here in the background, that you could um, fit the exquisite uh, um, little Baroque church of St. Carlo inside one of them. Um, this is, a, uh, I'm not quite sure what the origin is of this story, but anyway, at one point I tested it out and it turns out to be true only on a technicality. You have to cut off the various side chapels and arrange them in a different, um, in a different place. Anyway, uh, there is, the term then is also taken up by um, Khan's one time um, uh, employee, uh, Robert Venturi in his uh, early work on kind of um, architectural communication and symbolism, complexity and contradiction in architecture, in which it, it's defined in a much broader way as a sort of interzone that opens up between various primary formal decisions in a building. And so the, the paradigmatic example which he uses there is this 16th century building in Granada, where there's a big square gesture, which is the sort of urban formal gesture on the outside, and there's a big round gesture, which is this kind of perfect internal circular patio. And then everything else that happens in the building somehow has to configure itself within this uh, sort of formal incompatibility. And he has this whole series of little um, wiggly diagrams, which comes from um, elsewhere in the book, which sort of illustrate this. But he also talks about it in, in his terms, it doesn't really matter whether it's in plan or section. It's any kind of um, any kind of uh, he calls open poche this um, uh, sense of an ambiguous interzone between an interior and exterior. And he identifies one in this window detail in um, this church, uh, the Church of the Three Crosses by Alvaralto, um, which has a sort of vertically expressed window on the outside and a kind of diagonally expressed one on the inside and it creates it's sort of really just a, a slightly over elaborated double glazing detail but in the it's it's kind of been freighted with this um theoretical significance anyway i just want to park those two definitions because they what's interesting about them is how much they expand on the actually existing meaning of this term in um, in its original context, which is purely as a term of uh, relating to like conventions of presentation. So um, this is from a, a sort of late um, um, manual, kind of course manual, um, which says that the the function of colouring in the plan in this way of kind of bracketing the uh, internal kind of constructed nature of walls and making them into this plastic and interchangeable mass is purely to make them readable. It's just something which you impose on the design in order to allow it to be interpreted. And it's something which um, is sort of congruent with the, um, sort of coherent with the, like the emphasis within that school on uh, doing like massive fantasy neoclassical buildings. So the, 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 the sort of highest demonstration of your virtuosity as a, a, a kind of young wannabe architect is to design like um, what would have been the biggest building in the world um, with some sort of program like 
here's a headquarters for four different state banks in an ideal location or something like that. And that those, those sorts of drawings in order to be legible have to adopt certain forms of um, quite severe um, abstraction uh, in terms of uh, the information that they're trying to um, communicate. Um, and yeah, I mean, as you can see, that's sort of what enables them to work in a particular way. Um, the re the there's a whole story actually which I won't go into now. But the the way in which this translation happens is obviously kind of an interesting little study in um, the kind of social transmission of uh, like architectural memes. Um, the 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 it's there is this, a whole sort of francophile generation among American architects in the first around the turn of the century and kind of up until the first war particularly I think um, uh, among whom uh, the big statement move is actually to go to Paris and to go and compete for the Prix de Rome and all of this kind of thing and this is the this is the general if you're uh, the kind of person who reads reprehensible books this is the um uh, generation which is satirized in Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead as the kind of oppositional characters to the heroic Howard Rourke. Um, and so the Pochet Club of New of Chicago is that like um, the reason why I think it's it's kind of has this expanded um, or in a way becomes a placeholder for a whole lot of different ideas is that it's been adopted as um, uh, as a like in joke by that whole kind of generation. Anyway the the thing which I wanted to stress is that it, it's it, there is something meaningful going on in the translation from its original context to its kind of post-war one, which is that it, it's something which switches from being purely in the domain of representation to being something which is operative in the uh, kind of generation of a, of a design entirely. If you think about where it occurs in time in the design, in the original context, it's something which is applied at the kind of post-production stage, like that you already sort of know what the building is, and this is something which is applied as a kind of um, clarifying strategy to communicate an already existing uh, uh, kind of series of decisions. Whereas in its subsequent, you know, in the sense in which um, Khan or Venturi or, um, you know, or anyone else who sort of used the term in its, its received sense, it's something which is, uh, part of the conceptualization of the of the building. Um, yeah, switches from being an aid in interpretation to being a kind of tactical or of planning. And, you know, very clearly it goes from being something which fundamentally only actually exists in the drawing to something which is an identifiable spatial location in the building which you could actually stand in or, you know, um, stick your arm into or bury some treasure inside or whatever you, you happen to think. So um, I think that that is kind of, yeah, so uh, having sort of established that, I mean, the thing I wanted to say is that um, I think that the kind of later misuse of this term is much more interesting than the kind of early definition of it in this more limited sense. That, And I think that it's also, it's both that it seems to me to be kind of prescient um, and to identify something kind of meaningful, which is um, a general sort of statement about um, this kind of productive indeterminacy, which occurs at a certain level of abstraction, that um, when you're dealing with like a large problem with many granular elements, there's a point at which you kind of bracket all sorts of things um, in order to uh, allow the, the kind of the things which you're actually working with to become very simple and um, even to become simple to the point where th their meaning is almost called into question. Um, and so, yes, uh, I mean, in, in, in architecture, there's a kind of, um, there's a classic like, uh, opposition, a kind of conceptual opposition between the plastic and the tectonic. So buildings are obviously uh, tautologically constructed. They're made out of things. They're assembled out of discrete and um, dissimilar parts. Um, but they're also conceivable of as 
something in, in the world of kind of like pure form, like a pure kind of opposition between space and mass. Um, and push A is obviously um, a kind of decisive uh, move in favor of the plastic um, over the tectonic for, for it, it's kind of strategic use. So you can kind of see here, this building in reality, I mean, this building is not, it's not a real building, but it, it would in reality be made of all sorts of different things, but in fact has become one substance on the page. Um, and you can think, you know, how different it is from these type of, um, these type of, the actual, the actual kind of world of the building as this thing made up of all of these very complex and interrelating technical systems, um, um, which doesn't need to be dwelled on too long, but I think that that's, that's kind of important. The, the, the thing which I think is sort of of interest that's on top of that is that um, at a certain point, this kind of abstraction, uh, the readability of what's actually being shown starts to be called into question in, um, in, a, in a way like, how is it that you know what the various things on this plan actually are? Of course, there's a convention that um, different orthographic projections are read together, that the plan is read with a section or an elevation or whatever that happens to be. But in practice, actually, the, the kind of promise of the, the plan with its sort of starkly defined poche is that you can read the whole of the building in the plan and that you can in make all sorts of interpretations of really very uh, subtle and ambiguous um, sorts of symbols so that you can read sort of relative hierarchy among spaces by the thickness of the walls, which are a kind of communication of the likely height of the space, or that you can sort of read various like very minor projections um, are expressive of perhaps a sort of certain sort of decorative order that which might be going on, which again might tell you something about um, about the type of thing which you're which you're looking at. Um, and at a certain point, uh, I became very interested in the speculative sort of what, uh, yeah, the, the sort of speculative potential of this this kind of slipperiness which seems to happen at the extreme end of plasticity. Um, the way in which something um, is kind of hovering on the threshold of legibility and the fact that it's um, the fact the very fact that it is that that's called into question is also part of what makes it productive that the um, a slip of the pen or a kind of uh, bit of sort of little scribble of the brush the other way might kind of uh, in the recursive world of design process sort of suggest to you something which you hadn't previously thought of anyway. Um, so there, there, was a, there was a sort of science fiction which I was playing around with, which was this idea I called the magic photocopier, which was this idea that um, you, you, could, you could imagine like a sort of sufficiently intelligent um, computer you could feed it all of these sort of ambiguous Rorschach-like patterns and it would find some way through a kind of um, calculated brute force techniques to turn them into one or another sort of um, interior space. Um, and uh, at a certain point, I, I realized that the sort of technical means to try and make this more or less existed. Um, so this was, uh, uh, I, I kind of tried to explore the potential of um, using um, a machine learning um, algorithm called pix to pix in order to synthesize these um, these types of very very characteristic like heavy um, castle plans out of um, patterns of more or less uh, well so, sort of random noise which has been helpfully thresholded in a certain way so this was it was kind of trained on things which looked like this and it was meant to try and produce things which looked like this on the right and it would kind of get well, part of the way there. Um, and it was not an, uh, an unambiguous like success, but it was kind of interesting. So it, was, um, it would do its best to understand these very weird, um, these very weird sort of things and, and, and turn them into something which looked more, uh, which looked more like, uh, yeah, the sort of castle world. Some of them are almost convincing. 
Um, so if that's not enough, I then I the other thing I sort of had a sort of second round of when I was putting all of this together, I had a kind of second round of speculation about Poche and something else about it, which seemed to me to be very uh, meaningful in terms of this sort of connection with space and particularly the digitization of space. Um, and that in particular, the kind of um, the position of uh, architecture with regard to like the digital at the moment is, um, I don't know if it's necessarily a dilemma, but it's something where like starkly contrasting approaches seem to be observed. And the, the idea of, of Poche as this bracketed and ambiguous uh, kind of um, understanding of the um, the like the world beyond the the kind of intentionally created space. It, it seems to be called into I don't know. It seems to be called into question in an interesting way for me. Um, so in the, in the kind of digitization of space, there are these two uh, kind of big trends which are observable. One of which obviously is the um, more and more granular um, uh, kind of like full resolution imagination of the of the building sort of BIM world. Um, um, but the other of which is its kind of complete conceptual antithesis, which is the sort of um, uh, this sort of um, the kind of virtual mesh world of um, either virtual reality or, or kind of computer games so that the, 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 the kind of the interior of the wall, whatever's in the poche in the, the current sort of digital moment seems to either be uh, like a granular and absolutely detailed assembly or a kind of absolute void, uh, which is no longer merely kind of unknown, but in some sense actually like outside of the world. Um, so, I think I probably want to leave it there really. I've had various of these, um, this is, there's a whole sort of genre of these videos in which computer games break down interestingly, but I think that you can probably go and find those, um, those for yourself and, and kind of leave you with that, um, that sort of open question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Luke, that's great. I mean, there's so many points, I think, between the two papers that are, are, are you know, instigate so many, many questions. And um, I think, you know, obviously we're now going to into the debate part of this session. And um, just maybe before we start to ask specific questions from the audience, maybe just to open it up um, the, and to kind of trace some parallels between these two diff very contrasting uh, topics, but actually with with some inherent similarities, it seems to me that the the uh, one of the key uh, similarities, the fact, of course, that you are looking in both cases at the um, uh, the indeterminacy of um, in the way that we read, respectively, nature and um, and architecture um, and space generally. Uh, through this, through these two different lens. So on the one hand, you've got the idea of the porosity of nature that Trevor discussed before, and then uh, in Luke's paper, the idea of the um, of the poche as as this interzone, uh, liminal space. Uh, so uh, just to start us off in, in thinking of of bridging the gap between these these two papers, any any thoughts, Trevor and Luke, and then we'll open up to the to the audience in terms of what where parallels can be drawn? Yeah, I mean, um, many, in fact. Um, uh, and I just want, I, I was just taking some notes as, uh, as Luke was um, um, speaking. And um, you described um, quasi-monumental boxy things deployed to hide the untidiness. Uh, and I thought, well, that's what nature writing is, isn't it? You, you've mm. got this creation of a kind of space where you're placing these things, you know, animals, nature, mountains, trees, or whatever, um, and they are quasi-monumental. Um, you know, Timothy Morton talks about characteristic megafauna, the kind of things that we think that we that we should feel kind of interested in and sympathetic towards, rather than uh, rather than viruses, uh, and so on. So, you know, nature writing does trade precisely in this simplification and domestication of even its depiction of, uh, of wild nature in order to hide the untidiness. And he is really keen um, to get us to think about um, what this um, porous, boundary crossing, messy, 
um, uh, uncertain aspect of nature uh, might be. And again, I encourage people to read Humankind, Solidarity uh, with Non, uh, Solidarity with Non-Human People, um, which is this absolutely um, fantastic text uh, by him. The, um, the next thing that I thought was a, a really striking parallel, um, you talked about um, bracketing um, the uh, internally kind of constructed aspect of things in order to make things readable. And I thought, well, you could just be describing the, the metaphysics, uh, you know, the assumptions that we have about what nature is in order to make it describable in, in nature writing. Um, um, and then I thought there was something also really interesting. You talked about the, the shift of the kind of poche historically as it sort of um, uh, moves through practice from being something that's purely representational to something which is sort of operative uh, in production. And I thought, well, <laughs> again, that's exactly the same kind of thing, that the representation that, that you find in nature writing is a mode of operative production. You're not describing something to there. You're, you're, you're bringing something uh, into representation precisely in order to make it operatively uh, productive for you. Um, next parallel, uh, you talked about bracketing for simplicity. And I thought, yeah, this is really interesting. Morton talks about a term which he calls the severing, um, which he relates to a, a, a mode of, of human production, which is based on the shift um, into sedentary agriculture. And, and, and he's really trying to get us to think about it. when When we are um, thinking about nature, it's not that nature that we can go out to over there, but it's the metaphysics, the underlying cosmology um, of nature that is brought into being um, where we're treating things in that Heideggerian sense of a kind of standing uh, reserve of energy, which is leading to this terrible over-extraction and the um, sixth Anthropocene, uh, sixth um, mass extinction, the Anthropocene extinction. For, for Morton, um, it is this mode of thought, a metaphysics which he calls agri-logistics, which comes out of Mesopotamian thought space. So in some sense, you know, we're, we're, we're still laboring in this um, cosmology that was created many thousands of years ago. And that, he calls this the severing, um, which is the, the bracketing of nature um, for simplicity. For the, for, the, for the simple purposes of, of what a sedentary agricultural civilization might require. Um, what else did I, um, what else did I think? Uh, yeah, and you, 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 I think you said, you know, how do you know what the, these things are? Um, and again, that, that touches on the idea that I just talked about. You know, there's a metaphysics of agrologistics which creates a sense of sort of social, um, natural uh, space. And that metaphysical production of space in our, our imaginary of space allows us to read a relative hierarchy. And that is also built into language um, as well. At the beginning of, of humankind, Morton says, how am I going to talk about nature? What am I going to do? What's the pronoun? for nature? Do I call it it, we, me, they? Um, you know, there's, the, there's a logic of separation of, of here, there, um, you know, subjectivity, objectivity, that is built into language, that language is a kind of bracketing for functional space that serves the interest of this, as he, as he says, uh, agri-logistic system. What else? Um, <laughs> there's so many correspondences that it was really, really <laughs> interesting. Um, uh, you talked about uh, slippery, you, you know, your interest in slipperiness at the extreme end of things, of what, what it is that might be kind of hovering beyond intelligibility. Uh, and Morton uses this term to talk about nature as, as having a kind of spectrality. You don't see that in the conceit of nature writing, where again, you're, you, you go off and you, and you describe these, these lumps of space, mountains, rivers, uh, trees, all these interesting beings. But that isn't what nature is, Morton suggests. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll leave this until a little bit later and, and, we'll, and we'll open it up. But he talks about a concept of nature that he calls the symbiotic real um, and a, a quality of nature which he describes as spectrality, which is this, you know, this, this slippery thing which is hovering beyond intelligibility, which normally, you know, we tidy away. We don't think of that as nature. We think of of nature as the, uh, as the things that can be described through their surface appearance in volumes of space. What else? Um, let's have a look. I think I, there are a few other things that, that uh, mm. I thought we might, that might be interesting um, uh, to, to, to talk about, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment.
Definitely. And it's it's brilliant to see again these interdisciplinary um links between between the two. And there was something very uh look in, in the animations that you showed at the end. There's something very poignant in terms of going back to yes. what Trevor was talking about. This this idea of the of the human being uh, in these um kind of making sense of the of the spaces um again the spaces in between somehow. And Luke, did you did you have um other thoughts in terms of these relationships between the, uh, your talk and and um, the Trevor's uh, topic. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that I was I was very much nodding my head along when we were Trevor was talking about this um, uh, the sort of the kind of the pitfalls of thinking about things in terms of top access mode, mm -hmm. and in in a in a way, I'm kind of uh, I'm very I'm very like sympathetic to the critique that. More, that Morton is is making about um, the way in which we kind of habitually sort of idealize and 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 um, and kind of uh, yeah sort of sort of misunderstand or kind of deliberately kind of interpose a kind of fake nature in between us and the, and the real thing. I guess I, I one of the things I find interesting is um, that 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 sort of simplification and that kind of abstraction is something that somehow needs to happen in order to get things done i guess because it's a, it's a bit of a weird edge case or it's a bit a bit kind of outside of time these sorts of architectural um uh examples of it maybe also because they're very extreme do do sort of demonstrate an operation which otherwise perhaps we're sort of unaware that we've re even doing because it's so um, sort of conventional and uh, uh, kind of habitual. Um, I, I, there's something which I'm struggling to put my finger on but which I found very uh, very kind of meaningful about the idea of like the therapeutic and the, um, uh, the, the sort of idea of consolation. I mean one of the things one of the things I didn't really go into in the in terms of the project of Khan's architecture is the idea that um, this strategy of um, uh, of kind of of the hollow column of kind of reducing things to this menagerie of uh, of like monumental elements of different sizes is a way of preserving meaning um, in architectural space from the kind of threat of ever increasing technologization and, um, and kind of services and all of these things which sort of conspire to um, overwhelm and kind of make impossible a sort of this kind of primary and much idealized uh, kind of connection between humans and, and meaningful space. So that this, um, yeah, that this kind of bracketing operation is very much being deployed in order to um to make possible a kind of uh yeah uh, like to keep continue to continue to allow the sort of anthropocentric world to persist even in in like human created spaces which otherwise it's sort of with everything being as sort of futuristic and 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 kind of um mechanical uh, as it is sort of uh, seems to be under threat um I don't know, I might throw it open to other people if mm, other people have kind definitely. of observations to make. I think other things will probably cohere in my yeah, head as we go along. And Absolutely. So let's let's open the debate. So so I'm I let's invite some questions from from the audience. And um Hannah, please let me know if the, if I can't see anybody in case somebody raises their hand, I can't see it. I can't Everybody's... see any hands, I'm afraid. Okay, um, that's I really <laughs> me neither, uh, Morris. Yes, feel free to go. Um, I, I, there are a number of things that, uh, that both talks have uh, triggered. Um, I'm not, not sure that I've got a coherent question, but um, it might help um, if I try to make the connections. Um, the the uh, plastic versus the tectonic. Um, I always think uh, that those uh, drawings of, of the buildings uh, 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 that you showed Luke, uh, I always thought, well, they're just built of stone, you know, they're all made of stone, so it's dead simple, really. Um, and uh, if it's uh, bricks and mortar, it's still stone, you know, it's still masonry, so you always find a word that makes it just simple. And um, so, uh, and then, then one thinks of all the other senses, apart from the visual, 
you know, the weight, the smell, the touch, uh, which stone has. And so I hope that's how I imagine what's going on in there. Um, and um, if, if you, uh, and that simplification which you talk about, um, to me is, is a technique for feeling the architecture at a certain scale. And it's also a method of, as you say, the operative, it allows you um, to make it. So it's a, and it's about scale. It's a, you know, when you're teaching students to design or when you're even, when you're trying to uh, aggregate variables together so that you can move um, in Benjamin's term, you know, forwards uh, 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 um, resolutely, um, uh, you perhaps need to look at what you're doing at different scales and you need to simplify, as you said, that's just another word you use. Um, and, and so then there's another aspect in which it's also operative, which is a recent interest of mine, which is the imaginary. And uh, if you are, um, if, if you are, and I wouldn't see imaginary as necessarily as progressive, so that you move from one to the other, it's out of date, it's colonial, or it's just after the First World War, and that's how they looked at it, and we need to move on to a better one. I would see it just as alternatives, particularly if you're working with communities who may have, a, in your terms, an old-fashioned view or a, or a gender-specific view or, 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 or a colonial view. And, and, and it may be that's what, when you're working with community or you're working with a, 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 a sort of diverse set of societies, you need to know what those imaginaries are so you can, as an architect, instead of saying, this is your design, build it, you might say, well, what, what do you imagine? And then you can represent it and you can, you can have a representation. As your role as an architect would be to represent those different dimensionaries and so that there's a proper dialectic um, or, uh, about that amongst the communities that you're working with. Um, you can't uh, necessarily give a value judgment always about what's better when you're actually operating. Um, but I do take Trevor's point about, um, you know, this Heidegger thing about it being a, a reserve that you can extract from and, and what we should be doing is trying to balance ourselves with it, that, but, but perhaps beyond that now we have this emergency. So are we in a crisis situation where the nature is a virus, you know, or, or are we in a, you know, we've got to stop being uh, extractive and, and, and reach a, a, a balance with that. That's, it's difficult to know, but those are two different approaches which would have a different imaginary, wouldn't it? And, and, and then you'd be able to debate that if you could imagine the impact of what would that look like if you had took that approach, what would it look like with the other one? So um, I guess those are my uh, thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Morris. Any, any thoughts, Trevor and Luke? I mean, I had one on, yep. um, oh, sorry to jump into it. I mean, with regard to kind of um, climate and thinking about, you know, the climate emergency and these sorts of things, like innately, a lot of the thinking that we are doing is High, you know, of its nature, highly simplifying. It's highly kind of reductive. It's often thinking about things in terms of sort of fundamental flows, in terms of like reductions to certain sorts of like mega scale processes. I, I mean, I'm not sure. I think when you, you know, when you sort of move to uh, like energy flows around the planet or um, kind of the various processes which um, produce carbon dioxide or even um, a kind of atmospheric carbon dioxide as a kind of proxy for the emergency itself, all of which are sort of necessary preconditions to certain forms of action or regulation. But they, they're all, you know, they're enormous. Obviously, they're also enormous simplifications. And I think that, I don't think that there's a way around adopting those kind of, those kind of reductions, actually. But, but obviously, you can have a, a kind of due sort of caution and circumspection about um, about what's involved with taking them on. And just, um, you know, it, it made me think about a distinction that Timothy Morton uh, makes in, in Humankind, where he says, you know, we need to get out of an anthrop uh, an anthropocentrically scaled relationship to nature. But that doesn't mean that we're not thinking about anthropomorphism. And when he talks about anthropomorphism, this is a much more kind of ragged and uh, an open-ended, 
uh, exchange. You know, we're acting on other beings, on the environment, though that environment and those other beings are acting on us. We're being morphed as much by the environment and other beings as we are uh, morphing them. So I thought that was, you know, that maybe there's something to, to say about um, uh, architecture that isn't anthropocentrically scaled, but that is anthropomorphically scaled and, and, and which is trading in this you know, uh, uh, open-ended, uncertain, promiscuous relationship with, with beings in its environment. Um, Morton's work comes out of uh, and, and, and takes into the, an ecological um, realm, um, a, a branch of philosophy that's called object-oriented ontology, that, that comes out of um, Graham, Graham Harmon's uh, work. And Harmon talks about some architects that he thinks are are, are, are interesting in, in the way that they have been um, uh, influenced by, by Triple O. And I had brought up um, um, some tabs of, of images um, by these architects that, that Harman identifies, and I thought I could uh, share these at some point and get the architects here to respond to them. And, That'd uh, be great. Yeah. yeah, Trevor, feel free to show. Yeah, okay. Let's have a go. Here we go. Um, okay, so this... Um, I, I, yeah, I, I haven't got a kind of... Um, I haven't, got a, 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 a thought about this but I, but I just wondered if 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 he, a, the architects here um, did have some uh, uh, responses to them oh my goodness it's hard to interpret some of it I think I mean obviously there's a sort of um, Okay, well, that one is very clear. So that's Piazza Navona, is it? Or is that, um, where is that? Is that actually Paris? Yes. Um, it's Paris. Oh, is it? It's, it's Leal, it's the garden, the gardens behind Leal. Um, it is, isn't it? Yeah, that's the boss and that's, that's the boss. That's yeah. It's difficult in architecture because in some ways um, it feels like you've seen all of the um, the kind of formal strategies in various guises before. So this kind of like agglomerative, slightly utopian feeling um, strategy obviously has a, a certain history in um, in connection with people like Constant and um, uh, the, the, the kind of situ the sort of architectural wing of situationism. Um, and it's very difficult to know whether to implicitly read that content into the into the formal proposition or, or not this time. Um, it's obviously made of lots of different bits and it um, seems to be, I mean, one of the readings is that this seems to be like a thing which is deliberately like withhold, sort of frustrating the attempt to be interpreted, might be. Um, <laughs> I, I can see. I can see. Matt has got his hand up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'm not about to resist that kind of provocation. But, <laughs> um, I mean, I don't really have much to say except. I mean, uh, Harmon maybe more than Morton has been has uh, become part of a currency of discussion, certainly in architectural theory and philosophy. Um, kind of rethinking Heide Heideggerian thought about. Uh, phenomenology um, for a kind of current generation who are um, uh, uh, queasy because they've had too many bits and bytes and too much virtual reality and they want something that can make these claims to reality and I um, I just I've made a little note while um, Trevor and uh, Luke were talking about what might wh where there might be some parallels especially around the kind of practice side of they were talking of what they were talking about which has a parallel with this question of where Harmon or Morton go in terms of the kind of world that is envisaged in theory and philosophy and I think that there is an attempt to restore something about reality and of the real but interestingly in some of these um, images that we get from people like David Roy it, it becomes a kind of re uh, a, a kind of a um, reclaiming of some prior, primordial stuff, some primordial world that has that has this over that that does um, inhabit, if you like, the overlap between um, what uh, Trevor was saying about writing nature 
and what Luke was saying about um, uh, carving out space, if you like. So if poche, and if we think of poche as a verb, the kind of pocketing, um, I mean, the pocketing is the scooping gesture. Uh, if you think of pocketing as a verb, and you are making that space by carving out of the pr primordial mud uh, that um, uh, Trevor was implicitly referring to in the ancient Near East, and, and, the, and, the, and, and, the, and the myth of Marduk and so forth that we were all inducted into as students. And then on the other hand, we, Trevor is talking about writing nature into being in this way that looks, I mean, that, that looks at this idea of porosity, but is also trying to find and claim something through writing that we have had taken away from us. And what I like about this version, where we talk about the practice of making reality, whether it's through architectural poche or, or kind of um, uh, creative or other forms of writing, there is this um, labor that we are reminded of, that it takes an effort to find reality. And I think the idea that some of these architectural gestures are trying to establish a space for the real um, uh, that we get, for instance, Poche, Rem Koolhaas is said to have rediscovered Poche because he got too fed up with this flimsy architecture that doesn't really exist. So to make something that is more fundamentally architectural, you need to rediscover how to reclaim reality. And I think this is one of the sort of philosophical strands that we can see in this gesture to we were towards finding a new way of, if you like, writing nature into being, because so much of the writing that we have had in recent times has been about setting it apart. Thank you very much, Matthew. And, and just to sort of come, come back to this, um, I think one, one of the things that Morton is encouraging us to do is, is, is to dial down our sense of, 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 um, of, of anthropocentrism in the sense of being the authors of nature solely, but being receptive to nature because it's already there. So rather than ramping our sense of things up to a world that is enormous and all encompassing, what he calls a kind of explosive holism, he, he suggests that this agri-logistics of Mesopotamian space has created a kind of metaphysics where we're constantly thinking about bigger and bigger holes and, and more and more encompassing uh, metaphysical domains. Uh, and his argument that is that, that that in a sense that leads us into just this question of, of who is the top correlator, which kind you know human beings are the top correlator, which kind of human beings, which moment in culture, um, uh, which form of uh, of human authority gets to be the kind of correlator at the top. And when he talks about Heidegger, uh, obviously, and, and he touches on Heidegger's Nazism, it, it is you know it's a certain kind of uh, of German. Um, correlator at a particular, uh, you know, Nazi correlator at a particular uh, moment that has authority um, uh, over this space and meaning creating uh, domain. So what he's, I think, asking us to do is to he, a, a reverse form uh, of imagination where we go towards a kind of implosive uh, holism where we start seeing world as not something which is uh, grand and monumental, but rather something which sort of um, self implodes and which is uh, ragged and porous uh, and which has all these, uh, these, these holes in it and plenty of stuff is coming towards us as much as stuff is, is, is coming out of us. Um, and I think that's the difference between this, this explanation that he has where he's, he's asking us to think against things being anthropocentrically scaled, to come back to this term, and think about things being anthropomorphically scaled. And that means seeing what is morphing everything else within this extremely kind of open-ended, uh, ragged, porous um, space. I, I had a couple of other, um, there were a couple of other architects um, that um, Harman... Uh, yeah, this is fun. Let's have a look likes. And, I, and, and I don't know them, and, and, and architects here will, and uh, I just thought it would be uh, interesting to have a, uh, a look at these. This is some um, Tom Wiscombe, um, and again, people might have uh, things to say uh, about this, and I think there was there was there was something about, uh, that, that, that I can't remember whether it was Matthew or Luke that said it about space receding, meaning me, structures of meaningfulness receding, or, or you know, or being in this kind of odd uh, interstitial, uh, ambiguous mode. It's interesting because, like, it feels like um, there's always a certain opportunism in the relationship between architectural form and um, kind of contemporary theory. I feel like um, 
this sort of fluid language of continuous and uh, uh, kind of undulating surfaces is again it, it's one which had a sort of previous um, uh, incarnation in the the Deleuzian nineties um, when it was sort of associated with um, uh, with yeah sort of the the, the kind of idea of um, well, I mean, it's never totally clear how these things are meant to be put together, but like the, the, these sorts of ideas of like territorialization and um, uh, sort of things like that. The, uh, the promise of that architecture was that it was going to create a sort of fluid continuity between everything, which I mean, sort of sounds um, like uh, a kind of form of like complete sort of ideological closure, but isn't really meant to be read that way. Um, I mean, I don't know. I think, for me, I think that the, like the true sort of relationship between the true sort of um, embrace of like a kind of an uh, Anthropocene thinking on the part of architecture isn't really something which happens in the domain of form. It's about thinking about the city and sort of urbanism and these sorts of human processes as things which have always been fundamentally a kind of forms of geology. That, they're, um, that they are, you know, actually the sort of the earliest dawning of kind of Anthropocene thinking in the 1860s or whatever is the, is the sort of study of various sediments under Vienna and the kind of uh, like the, the identification of, um, uh, of the anthropogenic like uh, origin of lots of things which previously seemed to be part of nature so like the, suddenly there are all of these like strata which have actually been produced by hu human processes over over hundreds of years and that sort of thinking sort of ripples outwards into um, um, into all sorts of other things. Thanks. Um, uh, look, we've got one more question. Uh, so Josie have you got a question? Hi um, I am not an architecture student <laughs> so I don't <laughs> But I do read Timothy Morton and I do like reading him quite a bit. But I want to talk a little bit about the um, gender fluidity of the Mandelbrot and having these inky movements in architecture and then taking the time to put them into rectangles and squares, therefore removes any gender fluidity and sort of safe spaces for thought, in my opinion. And so um, creating safe spaces for people and for thought in any way to be less anthropomorphized in our architecture or in our thinking spaces with all these different angles and sharp points everywhere. I just question one, sometimes just the safety of that and how we move through these spaces. And then also two, like we're not living in spaces that are organic. I mean, obviously in geology and, and within each plant and each, there are certain sharp points that exist. But I think that, um, I, I just think that it, we're missing points as far as what can be considered to be organic. And if you have like Mandelbrot or even some designs that are coming off of mycelium and things, then those are things that maybe can create more fluidity in the way that we perceive our spaces. And maybe we can have freer thoughts and be able to join up with nature more like more peacefully. Yeah. So this is an interesting point about the the relationship between uh, with nature in in the sense of of the of of the organic uh, way in which we um, we approach it. Luke, do you have a, Luke and Trevor? Do you have any any thoughts on this on this point? Uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to to, to Luke as architect. Um, I mean, yes, I think that it is a very interesting sort of problem, and I guess like. Uh, it's one of those questions which is sort of so simple that though we never asked it, which is like, where did the tyranny of the rectangle come from? Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. what's the what's the origin of this strange, um, like, yeah, this quadratic oppressor? Um, yes, I think um, I don't really. I I think it's it's a tremendously interesting question, but I don't I don't I don't like. I think that the, there's both this sort of problematic of like how, uh, to what extent the sort of literal sort of spatial closure of um, buildings and environments that like imposes various forms of limitation on um, kind of thought or relations or networks between people. Um, I think, yeah, I'm also very interested in, um, I tend to think that 
that the that in terms of like new relationships with nature it's sort of the domain of the material and also like the the like innate sort of variety of of of, of materiality rather than sort of iterating through the for different possibilities of pure form and space, which is going to kind of open up new territories. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. And um, we're getting to the to to the end of this talk, and um, and I just wanted to to um, to just double check if there's any last minute question, any last minute um, uh, additions that that Trevor or Luke wanted to add. So um, I think yes, Trevor, go for it. Possibly um, just bringing up a couple of slides because um, mm, one of the people here said, have you got stuck? Um, and uh, there was <laughs> stuff. Though, we got, uh, we got two Trevor. minutes, Trevor, go for it. I think that, you know, the one thing that I haven't mentioned is this idea of, uh, I'm going to stop sharing this and start sharing something else, this idea of um, uh, nature that, that, that Morton is trying to, to, to push us towards, which he calls the symbiotic real. Um, and he describes it this way, it's a weird implosive whole in which entities are related in a non-total ragged way. In symbiosis it's unclear which is the top symbiont, and the relationship between the beings is jagged, incomplete. Am I simply a vehicle for the numerous bacteria that inhabit my microbiome, or are they hosting me? Who's the host? And who's the parasite? And, and to come back to this idea of Heideggerian world, which he's sort of downgrading, you know, he, he says worlds are cheap. Um, and a, and, a, and a porously sort of interrelated, without the tattered incompletion of the symbiotic real at every scale, solidarity would have no meaning. So our sense of nature is, is, is a kind of radical uh, solidarity um, uh, with things. And the, and the other quality um, of, of nature that he talks about is, is spectrality. I think these two terms are really interesting. The more we think ecological beings, he says, a human, a tree, an ecosystem, a cloud, the more we find ourselves obliged to think them not as alive or dead, but as spectral. The more we think them, the more we discover that such beings are not solidly real, nor completely unreal. And this was particularly this, this idea that Luke, we were talking about, it, that, 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 that weird fringe at the end of things where, 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 where meaning and being are kind of hovering in this incomplete way. Um, beings are not solidly real nor completely unreal. In this sense too, ecological beings are spectral. Since the difference between life and non-life is neither thin nor rigid, we discover that biology and evolution theory are actually telling us that we coexist with and as ghosts, spectres, zombies, undead beings, and other ambiguous entities. And this also makes me think about um, the, the last question about uh, introducing ambiguity and a radical kind of ambiguity uh, into our sense of, of what counts uh, as nature. What I didn't talk about was, was what kind of nature writing I think might solve this problem of this great you know, monumental carving out of, of space. And uh, unfortunately, I, I left my copy of the book in uh, in my office, and I can't get access to the office at the moment. And I, and I, and it isn't it, it isn't descriptive non fiction uh, created non fiction realism. It's actually a, um, a couple of short stories by A. S. Byatt um, called Angels and Insects. And as I was really struggling to think of a of a kind of book that could give us this rather weird symbiotic spectral picture of nature. It was those two short stories that, that came uh, pretty immediately to mind. A.S. Byatt, Angels uh, and Insects. They're wonderful texts. I encourage um, uh, people to read them in their strangeness. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Th thanks also for all the suggestions. And if you look at the chat, there's uh, quite a few suggestions. And Matthew, you also made a suggestion about object-oriented architecture. Um, the and, and other readings that are um, that are, that are really uh, that are, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go in and have a look at it myself. And the other thing I was going to say is that yes, we are recording all these sessions, and um, they will be available on our on our website. So I'm just going to to first of all thank. Uh, Luke and Trevor for these amazing talks. Really, uh, it's it's been really uh, um, incredible to go, to go from from the um, the perspectives of of uh, um, of architecture and then and creative writing and literature to then of course go through uh, uh, interweave into philosophy and and so much um, so many other considerations. So that's exactly what these sessions are for, and it's brilliant to see them uh, you know um, spark so many questions.
questions. Um, a couple of reminders for uh, future events. So next week there will be a session hosted by a sister centre called Cube, and this particular session is going to be called um, is uh, entitled collaborating collaborating care, um, and, and that will be at on next Thursday, same time, five thirty. Just remember to check on our website because some of these sessions are lunchtime talks, and some of them are um, the evening five thirty till till seven uh, slot. So always just double check. And the other thing that's really, really important, on Thursday in two weeks uh, time, we're going to launch, officially launch our already very busy research centres. So that's the joint launch of Creature and Cube. And um, you're all invited. We want it to be a big event. Obviously, it has to be a remote one and uh, the current, you know, restrictions, but uh, it should be celebratory nonetheless. So please do join us for that. And, um, and Hannah is, is, has just uh, sent all the um, information. Thank you very much, Hannah. So I want to thank again, our wonderful speakers. Thank you to the audience for being with us. And thank you, Hannah, for, for, um, for your support. And, and that's it. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye.